Welcome. So we, when we say scientists, uh, we really mean subject matter experts. So that could be uh, clinicians, teachers, revolutionaries, social change artists, whatever, whatever the, the expert is. We will talk about our experience as the case study scientists. Yeah, because our, our experience is that at my company, Playmatics, and Dan, through his own consulting and game development, we've worked with a number of different scientific projects, ranging from things around executive function to various kinds of healthcare to various kinds of behavioral change and modification. So the uh, advice we're offering is based on several projects that we've worked on individually and collaboratively. Yeah, so for the interest of time, I say, let's introduce each other because it goes shorter that way. Uh, Nick is a game designer, world class, created a game called Diner Dash, has worked with other scientists in various serious games or whatever we call them these days. And Dan is an executive producer and business strategy guy who's been in the games industry for years and years and years and has a resume that would take far too long for me to explain. Isn't he nice? So we have two basic premises here that we're going to talk from, which I think are, are serious issues. One, you uh, as the game developer need to understand that you don't really understand the scientist's realm, point of view, language, or expertise. You, as the scientist, subject matter expert, do not understand the game developer's process, methods. Uh, basically, all of you, from the point of view of your collaborators, talk funny and act funny. Yeah, and so as you approach each other, you're actually going to see that your processes are very different. Like, the biggest learning thing that I ever discovered working with scientists is that that re people working in research are on very different schedules and have a very different understanding of what a schedule is than I do. And when you try to just apply your language of schedules to someone else's language of schedules, you could end up in a lot of trouble. And especially if you don't define terms up front, uh, a lot of really difficult questions can come up in the late stage of a project that can delay things, make things very difficult, or actually cause you to fail at your success criteria. Yeah, so short, short case study. Uh, I was uh, briefly working with AT&T people. I said, what do you mean by immediately? 90 days. Uh, which, you know, for government agencies is like, yeah, and for game developers, not so much. So one, the, our, our core theme is you got to work from the mission and from the goals. Nick's going to talk about designing the experience. So effectively, when you think about what it is to make a game around science, typically what happens is there's like a couple of approaches that scientists come at you with. One is that there's been a tested hypothesis that's been done in laboratory settings that works. Like maybe there's a treatment that someone came up with that they've examined in a laboratory setting and they can show it has efficacy, but they haven't actually been able to get into a form where people would adopt it. Alternately, it may be that there's a hypothesis of something that could work as a treatment or something that might be useful in a research setting, and it's very clear what that hypothesis is, but it hasn't been tested in a way that's really effective. So what you need to do as you begin a, a process is really get all of that information out of the sciences that you can. The key thing at the beginning of the project is to get a, as big a dump of information as you can manage in as short a period of time and to concentrate almost exclusively on that because if you're not doing that, you're actually not fulfilling the mission of the process. And what a lot of game developers do is it, without a knowledge of that information, they'll come with a toolkit of either game mechanics or game technologies they've already built and then they'll try to apply that to a research technique. But if the, the research technique or the hypothesis is very clear, that already exists. Trying to reverse apply a genre to it doesn't make any sense. The thing itself has some knowledge that you can get, and your job as the game developer is to learn that first. Yeah, so basically, there's a whole, many game designers work from, I have a hammer so the whole world works, whole world looks like a nail. Uh, the world class designers, I think Nick is one, work totally top down with the game emerging from the constraints of the moment. Quick question, how many of you identify in any way as, yeah, I'm a game developer game in any form? And how many say, no, really, I'm not? 50-50. Uh, OK, so I'm going to ask the question. Nick, what's a game designer? Uh, a game designer designs interactions and fun. That's the easiest way to think about it. We build systems that design interactions and fun. That is what I, as a game designer, know how to do. And to, make, to, to dwell on the point before, that doesn't mean I know science. That doesn't mean I know healthcare. That doesn't mean I know education. That doesn't mean I know anything about physics or biology or chemistry. What I understand is systems, interactions, and fun. So as a games business guy, the most interesting person to me on the team is the designer, because the whole experience is the designer's vision. Uh, that's where it's come from. So do you want to say more on that? Or yeah, well, so what this means as you approach a project is that the start of the project has to be effectively a handshake between <laughs> the scientist and the game developer. And that handshake can only happen if a whole bunch of things are made clear up front. And I think about them in sort of buckets of like what the mission is of the project. Uh, one really critical thing is effectively what does success mean? And Dan's going to talk about that in a little bit. Another thing is 
effectively, what's the core relationship to the science that we're trying to apply? Like, what is the technique we're talking about? What's the theory behind the technique? What's the research evidence that's made the technique appropriate? How do we understand exactly how the science operates? Because oftentimes, and this is, I think, where game developers fall down working with scientists, the science is actually really super clear about certain kinds of interactions that you may never have considered. So unless you take a good long time at the beginning to work together with scientists to get fluent in their language and understand what they're working on, there are all sorts of hiccups that can happen in the early part of the design process that you won't even be aware of, but that will derail your process. So uh, from a strategy and business point of view, clarification, I'm what the game industry calls an executive producer, which is not what the film industry calls an EP. Um, the strategy also has to come from the mission. In games, obviously, the strategy is you know lots of revenue, lots of users. Not necessarily in a project like this. It might be the scientific research results. It might be reaching millions of people with our important world, you know, life-saving message. It might be the effective intervention. And uh, we don't necessarily agree on understand each other's views of what, what strategy is. Again, up front, what are the goals? What are you trying to do here? Uh, you know, as a strategic process, I like to start with the endpoint, interpolate every, all the waypoints in between. You know, game development, it was the nasty trade show demo that takes you off track. In our world now, it's the it's phase one of the SBIR grant. Uh, so in, in terms of uh, key, and this is scientists, but most game developers need to be reminded of this. If you build it, they won't come. That's true in the games world, certainly. Here, it's like, okay, why is anyone gonna play this game? There's some incredibly successful, from the point of view of scientific intervention, medical intervention games, that no one can play anymore because they had no publisher, market, or distribution. So. Um, Let's, let's talk about the, the kickoff process. Well, and so what the kickoff process looks like in an ideal relationship, in my mind, is, is something like a summit, right? This is something that can be really powerful. When I kick off science projects, the thing I most like to do is sit down with the, with the scientific team for something like a full day or two days or like, a, like several four-hour meetings in a row. Three days. Three days, yeah. With the, the project that we're working on right now that just like literally just got phase two approved, um, we, we are working on, uh, like we worked on a three day summit where we just sat with the scientists and heard what they said. I didn't do any immediate game design in that meeting. All I did was take notes on how the science worked, what the scientists had studied, what research they had, I, I researched their things. And what our goal of this meeting was to produce a document that defined the success criteria. And that, that had a few levels as we described and I just wanna hit these beats again. What is it that we're trying to create? Is it an intervention? Is it a research result? How do we define that? How is that defined in the grant? How is that defined in the university's goals? And how are we strategically gonna reach those targets at the end of the phase that we're currently in? So a good designer loves constraints. Uh, Nick spent two and a half of the three days interrogating the behavioral scientists we're working for on all the core issues. He needed that to understand the design. I needed that because all of those constraints affect what revenue models we can have, what partners we need to have, who we might work with, how we go to market, how long they're playing, all those things. I needed it as much as he did. Furthermore, as the executive producer, I'm working with him from the scientist's point of view to manage his deliverables, from his point of view to manage the science, scientist intervention and support. So that kickoff was incredibly important for us. Last half day, we talked about what the game might be, but as the executive producer, I could assure the scientists, don't worry, you don't need a game concept. The game backstory comes last. What we need is for Nick to understand this stuff. And so, Basically, we exit that meeting with a list of effective deliverables towards the end of the project. And once you have that, it's great because then everybody has terms you can work from. It prevents feature creep like later on in the project. It allows people to have a clear sense of milestone and particularly in these multi-phase grant structures, there's a tendency on everybody's part to want to get ahead of the game and like build the game fully, get to the end, like really figure out what the full product's gonna be. And if that's not gonna get you to the next tranche of whatever funding structure you're on, you're actually going the wrong way. And that, I think, leads to an, an important point on the team makeup, which is where we want to pivot towards the end of this talk. Now, actually. The the <laughs> one of the most important roles that you have as a game developer is an executive producer on the scientist side. And if you're working on a game development project with, with a group that hasn't done development before, you as the game developer really want to encourage them to find a producer who can help manage the project. The reason why, from your perspective, is that you want somebody on the side of the people you're working with who understands what your development process looks like. So that if you have trouble or you have an need answers to questions or you need access to resources or there's demands that the schedule has that to you as a developer are really critical, there's someone who can speak that language on the other side and help you have that conversation. As a business guy, uh, I'm particularly a student of strategic partnerships. I've worked with Microsoft and actually enjoyed it. 
Um, so I think of the opposite who understands your language as the agent in place. A couple more details, uh, game developers, on how you're different and you have to understand that you're weird and different. The iterative development process, you know, a lot of the world like ha makes a plan, makes a spec, and manages to their plan, and iterative development can freak them out. However, it is absolutely essential to test. The good game designers are humble people because it's all about what happens in the early tests. And as early as possible, we seek failure. We bring out the most risky things. Is it usable? Is it fun? Is it pleasant? Do they like it? And that's exactly what Nick insisted on. You know, that, that's why that iteration has to happen. You have to have failure. Scientists or you know, experts, that's a good thing. That means they've tested it and we're learning. And I think that the iteration process is always something that people need to learn. I found that in almost every field I've ever worked, but with scientists in particular. Uh, the idea that you're going to test something quickly and sloppily and that you don't want the answer to every single question before the first test is not a natural thing for most people, particularly people who work with very large budgets with very high stakes. So educating people about that and having someone on the other side who understands that is great. And early, early on, you need the designer working with you on your intervention. Early on, I would like to be involved so you have the right designer with the right deal, deal and the right, right goals. Uh, but basically that collaboration and the mutual respect in any team is really what you want. So for us. the main takeaways I would say look like this. Uh, kick off your, your project with a long informational sharing session so that you can come fluent in each other's languages, but never think that you as the game developer became a scientist and never think that you as a scientist became a game developer. You're both there for reasons. Respect each other's processes, but understand that you don't know each other's processes and try to put someone in the middle who understands both processes so you can navigate that water together. If you do that right and you have targets that you establish early on that you stick to, you can make a successful science project. Thanks very much.